Welcome to Free Thoughts. I'm Aaron Powell. Trubber's out this week, and so co-hosting with me is my boss, Cato Vice President John Samples. Thanks for filling in, John. Thanks for having me. John and I are joined today by Gene Healy, Cato Vice President and author of the new paper, Indispensable Remedy, The Broad Scope of the Constitution's Impeachment Power. Welcome to Free Thoughts. Thanks for having me on. Were there debates about impeachment at the Constitutional Convention? Sure. Uh, it got uh, quite a bit of debate, uh, particularly uh, in July. Uh, and all of the debate really about impeachment at the convention focused on presidential impeachment. And what you, there was uh, a minority of the delegates, uh, Governor Morris, uh, Charles Pinckney, maybe uh, one other who uh, were against the idea of presidential impeachment altogether. And that view practically got shouted down at the convention uh, the, if, with an onslaught from Madison, Franklin, uh, and others uh, to the point where uh, Morris actually uh, – confesses that his mind has been changed by uh, the, the, uh, the, the assembled delegates and the, the enthusiasm for the necessity of presidential impeachments. And he, he admits that uh, at the end of that debate that, uh, there were, that impeachments for the president were necessary. Yeah, wouldn't it be like having a constitution without an amendments clause? I mean, a theory, you got to have a theory of mistakes to go with these institutions. And if you, how would you get rid of a president that was off track if you didn't have the impeachment? Well, the idea would be regular elections. And that was Morris's case. Uh, Madison said that, uh, you know, the, the security, that, that regular elections were not a sufficient security. Uh, he says, for example, that the president might lose his capacity uh, for after impeachment, he might turn out to be corrupt, and uh, I think a, you know one indication of how much broader this remedy was considered to be than we typically recognize today was Madison's uh, statement that uh, during this debate that. Uh, some mode of displacing the chief magistrate was indispensable uh, because of the possibility of the incapacity, negligence, or perfidy of the president. What did the English laws about impeachment look like? Because presumably that was that's the tradition that the framers were operating within and what they were looking to, for example. Well, impeachment has uh, about four centuries of history before we even get to the Constitutional Convention, and it developed as a means of uh, targeting people that were too highly placed uh, to be amenable to ordinary uh, legal process, uh, king's ministers. Uh, and uh, that history uh, was known to the, to the framers uh, in some detail. And that's actually where the phrase uh, high crimes and misdemeanors comes from. Uh, it was understood uh, not to be limited to the, – the funny thing about the phrase is uh, it has an odd resonance in contemporary language. It sounds like – it's one of the reasons people uh, somewhat understandably confuse impeachment with a criminal process because – well, it mentions crimes and mentions misdemeanors, which we think of as uh, lesser crimes punishable by up to a, a year in jail. It didn't really have that connotation uh, in English practice or, uh, you know, and, and that was understood by the uh, uh, founding generation. The, uh, you know, in contemporary language, high crimes and misdemeanors sound something like Grave felonies, but lesser offenses too. Uh, actually, it's a broad category of offenses committed by men in high places uh, who are, uh, and it's it's something that where that in a similar way that you could not enumerate all the rights of man in the the debate over uh, the Bill of Rights, you could not uh, enumerate. All of the possible abuses of power, offenses, uh, misbehaviors that a uh, 
that a highly placed federal official might commit. Um, so Hamilton says in the in the Federalist Papers that uh, you know this is the, these are offenses of a political nature um, and they can never be tied down by such strict rules as commonly govern criminal cases. Do we have evidence of uh, the debate about this at the Constitutional Convention? So you said so they sure. they pulled this term out of it, it was a term that had been in use, um, but did they? debate the specific meaning of what high crimes and misdemeanors were at the convention? Well, high crimes and misdemeanors comes a bit late in the convention. Uh, there's several uh, throughout the convention, various drafts, various proposals. Uh, there's uh, language about, uh, uh, you know, maladministration, misfeasance, corruption. Uh, high crimes and misdemeanors actually gets introduced by George Mason. Um, and it's a uh, at a point where uh, one of the committees has narrowed uh, the language for impeachable offenses to treason and bribery, and Mason says, "Well, you know, treason and bribery—that that's that that wouldn't reach a lot of great offenses against the Constitution." He mentions the uh, trial of Warren Hastings that, that's going on in England uh, that started just before the Constitutional Convention. He said, "You know, Hastings is not." guilty of treason. Um, so Madison uh, – Mason suggests maladministration as a standard. Uh, Madison objects to maladministration, says it would uh, basically mean that the president served the pleasure of the Senate and uh, Mason apparently uh, concedes and uh, put – and offers high crimes and misdemeanors which is had become this sort of – term of art in British impeachments. Um, now, there's a debate because of that exchange that uh, I don't know how much into the weeds you want to get, but some people have said, uh, see, maladministration was rejected at the uh, convention and it means that uh, you, you, you can only Im impeach the president for, uh, for being a crook or for abuse of power. Uh, but there's a lot of indication that high crimes and misdemeanors, uh, both in English practice and uh, as understood by the uh, the founding generation, incorporated some forms of maladministration, that uh, some forms of gross negligence, uh, inability to do the job were understood even by Madison to be contained within the phrase high crimes and misdemeanors. So to draw from this morning's paper, uh, there's an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal that says or argues directly that uh, uh, Justice Kavanaugh could not be impeached uh, now that he's on the court for things that happened before he went on the court. Is that in your understanding generally true of the impeachment power? It can only concern what goes on in the office itself? Yeah, I saw that op-ed. It's uh, by Rivkin and Casey, uh, and that particular part of it, at least, is nonsense. Uh, the uh, the idea that you cannot be, uh, in fact, our most recent impeachment of a federal judge in 2010 involves uh, this issue: uh, past behavior that took place, much of it prior to elevation to the to the post at issue. Uh, and this federal judge in, in 2010, Thomas Porteous, is impeached in part for lying to the Senate about uh, his background and sort of corruptly procuring office. And at the convention, uh, there were several delegates. Morris who was among them and uh, uh, Mason who, who mentioned various forms of so corrupting the the uh, presidential electors as an impeachable offense. So the idea that once you uh, – and I'm leaving aside the specific uh, circumstances of Kavanaugh. That's a, that's a different debate. But the general claim that they make in that op-ed that you cannot be – that you sort of – you enter the office – even if you lied your way into the office, that you enter that office with a clean slate and cannot be impeached for anything that uh, – that you did uh, up to, a, you know, confirmation for that office. That's just not true. When we're 
looking for evidence of what the scope of the impeachment power is, what high crimes or misdemeanors might mean, is it always looking at the political process? So in the sense that what we do is we we look at prior examples of impeachment and prior examples of you know whether it was actually is it, is it called conviction? Is that the term that so you file the articles I, I, removal. of removal. I mean, you do say convicted in the Senate trials. Sure. Okay. So do we just look at at that process, or is this something that courts themselves have weighed in on? Like, would the, could the Supreme Court weigh in on the scope of high crimes and misdemeanors if, say, the president were convicted in the Senate but rejected it, saying the Senate behaved unconstitutionally? Almost certainly not. The uh, the most uh, significant time that the court has looked at this was in a uh, uh, case uh, Nixon versus the United States, not involving Richard Nixon, but actually uh, an impeached federal judge, Walter Nixon, uh, kind of unlucky, uh, unluckily named. Um, and the court, uh, Judge Nixon had been impeached uh, and removed for perjury uh, and the, what he challenged about his impeachment was this process by which uh, the uh, the Senate, so as not to hold up Senate business entirely, uh, had a committee of uh, 12 senators who would review the evidence and prepare a report. And then the entire Senate would vote on impeachment. Uh, Judge Nixon challenged that as not – as denying him his right to a Senate trial – um, and in an opinion written by uh, Justice Rehnquist in uh, 1993, uh, the, the court held that, it, that basically the Senate had the sole power to try impeachments and that uh, this was a political question and uh, it had been directly committed to uh, another branch and the court wasn't going to touch it. I think in almost any conceivable circumstance, uh, that is going to be what happens. You are not going to see, uh, you know, the uh, you're not going to see the House impeach, the Senate remove a federal official, and the Supreme Court weighing in and saying that wasn't within the scope of high crimes and misdemeanors. So was Gerald Ford right when he was talking about William O. Douglas that? Uh High crimes and misdemeanors mean whatever a majority of the House of Representatives think it means? He's sort of right in a trivial sense uh, in the sense that uh, if uh, the House impeached and the Senate removed Donald Trump for the alleged high crime and misdemeanor of eating well done steak with ketchup or tying his tie too long, uh, that it even in that circumstance, it's highly unlikely that the uh, the Supreme Court is going to challenge that that determination. Uh, so, uh, in the sense that there is not going to be external review, then Ford was partially right, but I think uh, most mostly wrong in this in this sense. Uh, while there is not going to be an external arbiter like the court uh, to weigh in on the scope of high crimes and misdemeanors, the legal standard turns out to matter in practical terms. Uh, uh, one of the reasons that uh, in our first presidential impeachment trial, Andrew Johnson in 1868, one of the reasons that Johnson was able to escape conviction in the Senate was – uh, that uh, they based the bulk of the charges on violation of the Tenure of Office Act, and you know, which said in essence that he couldn't fire his own Secretary of War. Um, a the the Senate Republicans had more than enough uh, to convict Johnson on a party line vote, but uh, they they missed uh, several Republican votes. He escaped by one vote. And some of the Republican, the so-called Republican recusants, the Republicans who voted against conviction, uh, explained their vote in part by saying that they didn't think violation of the Tenure of Office Act uh, was an impeachable offense. So uh, I think when you the, – the legal standard and the grounds for impeachment tend to turn out to matter in practical terms even if you're – there's no – 
likely scenario in which uh, the, it, they can be challenged in the courts. So we've talked around this a little bit, but maybe it would help our listeners if we made it explicit. So, like, what what does the process for impeachment look like? How would how does one play out? Well, uh, there's not much procedurally in the uh, in the Constitution. The House has the sole power of impeachment. The Senate has the sole power to try impeachments. Uh, the penalties are limited. Uh, to removal from office and possible disqualification for office. Uh, in practical terms, what usually happens now uh, is uh, if Donald Trump were to be impeached, uh, the uh, it would uh, first go to – an impeachment resolution is generally goes to the House Judiciary Committee uh, and the uh, the the impeach the bulk of impeachment resolutions die in the House Judiciary Committee. But the House Judiciary Committee, uh, if they're conducting an inquiry, if it saw fit, would uh, report that out to the uh, full House. And uh, if the House voted uh, the articles of impeachment, uh, they would. That's then, just a simple majority vote. Yes, uh, they would select House managers to try the case uh, before the Senate. They'd notify the Senate uh, of the impeachment and uh, then the the Chief Justice presides in a Senate impeachment trial of the president and uh, – which doesn't matter a whole lot because the uh, – the majority of the Senate can overrule a ruling by the Chief Justice. Uh, I think Rehnquist, when he presided over the Clinton impeachment trial in early 99, uh, at the end of it, he said, I did nothing in particular and did it pretty well. So they – so you said the House – the House points House officers to try it in front yep. of the – Senate. so are these, are these congressmen? Yes. So they pick they pick like a prosecutor and a defense attorney, no. basically, or how does this? Uh, the uh, the the president uh, in the past has had his own defense counsel. That's up to him. The House managers are uh, essentially the prosecutors. Uh, you know, if you think back to the most recent presidential impeachment, uh, you had folks like uh, Lindsey Graham who was in the House at the time was a House manager and. Uh, Bob Barr, uh, the former – went on to be an LP nominee for uh, president, was another House manager in that case. Well, there's another aspect of this that comes to mind, which is that impeachment in itself as a removal from office, the second part, is – you know, it has a real – follow on to it. You're removed from office. You may be exposed later to actual uh, criminal uh, indictments and so on. Uh, and so that's very concrete. But I think we also, you know, you never can tell about things, but you would sort of say looking down the road, it's going to be hard for anyone to have the necessary supermajority to remove a president absent some extreme. And even if you might have extreme acts that in this kind of partisan atmosphere are not going to produce a supermajority, right? So the it's hard to see and correct you guys can disagree here, but how you're going to get a removal from office, right? Or that's going to be pretty unlikely. So what you really have is impeachment itself, which is the House side and it's the indictment. And it's a very political act. What the Clinton um, – the, the harms to the president uh, or the benefits seem to be political in nature, right? And with Clinton, what, you, what Clinton showed was while it looked like going in – that impeachment was going to do him a lot of political harm, it actually ended up doing him a fair amount of, of, of political benefit, I think we have to say, because the popular judgment was that this was overreaching given everything that had happened. So is that really what we're talking about in a practical terms, looking down at least over the next decade or so, that impeachment is not going to remove anyone from office short of something tremendous? But it is – and it's a two-edged sword in terms of politics. Well, it is true that uh, it, it takes extraordinary historical circumstances. So however broad the framers understood the scope of uh, 
high crimes and misdemeanors to to be, and I provide uh, evidence in the paper that uh, it was quite broad. They may not have understood uh, how difficult they had made the you know the the change to the two thirds requirement for removal in the Senate comes very late in the convention. They're tired, gets no debate. They didn't really predict the uh, the rise of. Uh, of political parties was it was it a simple majority before or it had been a majority through most of the convention uh, it's the committee of the committee of eleven that uh, uh, makes it a, a two thirds uh, require two thirds of the senators present to remove uh, and uh, it just doesn't seem to get very much notice uh, doesn't really get any debate uh, they were not. Uh, Again, they 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 didn't seem to envision the uh, rise of political parties as as happening as quickly as it did, and the, the combination of that high bar to removal and uh, the parties uh, has meant that you only get impeachments in these sort of you only get a close to presidential removal in extraordinary circumstances like. Uh, post reconstruction dominance uh, of the Republicans in the Senate, and uh, you know Richard Nixon in in seventy four. Uh, so the structural barrier does mean that in in practical terms, you may need something like Nixon uh, on the level of uh, of uh, Nixon's abuses to get close to removal or to force a president out. Uh, that said, uh, I don't think that it's the case that impeachments are pointless uh, unless you manage to remove the the official impeachments. Uh, there was debate during the Clinton years about, uh, well, maybe we should just censure him. Uh, I'm willing to bet that neither of you can name three presidents who've been censured. Nope. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> you win. <laughs> uh, history, history is, uh, you know, the, the, the one that people can name uh, usually is Andrew Jackson uh, over the Bank of the United States, uh, which was then expunged. Uh, but censure – while it's possible, is sort of a non-issue. Impeachment turns out to be censure with teeth. Uh, it can be used to enforce important constitutional norms, uh, and it becomes, for as infrequently as it's actually accomplished, uh, impeachment in the House is something that presidents are scared of. Uh, you know, in it's the first thing people know about Andrew Johnson. It'll probably be in the first paragraph of Bill Clinton's obituary. And uh, history is a funny way of reevaluating some of these things. A lot of historians are reevaluating uh, the Johnson impeachment, which was for years taken to be an abuse of power by the radical Republicans. And even right now, people are reevaluating the uh, people on the left uh, are reevaluating the Clinton impeachment. Uh, I think the consensus view is still that it may have been, a, in some ways, a, a, a waste of time and money and a distraction, but uh, it's an important part of Bill Clinton's legacy. And in the middle of the Me Too movement, uh, I, I've seen uh, quite a few folks, Michelle Goldberg in the New York Times, Matthew Iglesias, a few other uh, people say that Bill Clinton really should have resigned. What he did was disgraceful. But in saying it's a political or probably even primarily a political institution now, that's not necessarily to say a bad thing in the sense that uh, the presidency itself is much more of a political institution than it was probably intended to be in 1789. The other thing that struck me about what you said about the founders was they were sort of – on their behalf, choosing majority uh, impeachment vo voting rule or 
two-thirds or 60 percent or something. They also had this big concern about it, uh, the presidency being too dependent on the legislature. So I can see where from their position, they didn't foresee that – we. they thought the legislature – Congress was going to be the most powerful. They didn't see our circumstances, which is where you've really had a change where the presidency and the court – are much more powerful than they look like they were supposed to be and the states and Congress are much weaker. So in a sense, history has is, is undone the, a judgment that might have been a reasonable one had Congress turned out to be as powerful as, as it's supposed to be. Yeah, Madison thought that uh, legisla the legislature was uh, – legislatures everywhere were drawing all power into their impetuous vortex. Uh, in modern circumstances, it's clearly the executive branch that – is drawing all all the power to itself. What's strange is that as uh, the presidency has grown over the years from a comparatively modest chief magistrate into this figure with full spectrum dominance over American and international life, at the same time you've seen a drift away from – you've seen – Almost a, a rejection of the very idea of discussing impeachment with, with regard to uh, an elected president. Uh, we, you know, we use the the term the I word uh, as if there's something blasphemous about it, and it's become uh, as the presidency has grown more and more powerful, uh, we've shrunk more and more from what the the framers thought was a was an essential remedy to abuse of that power or incapacity and negligence in the exercise of that power. I'd like to go through some of those. You lay out in the, the paper, you discuss kind of the, the big categories of grounds for impeachment. Um, so what's so the, the first one is you talk about is incompetence, I think. Like what, what level of incompetence are we talking about here that you think would be or that the historical record shows would be grounds for impeachment? Well, I think the early cases uh, are usually a better indication. Those the ones that are sort of contemporaneous with the uh, ratification, roughly contemporaneous with the ratification of the Constitution uh, are a better indicator of – the scope of high crimes and misdemeanors than later cases uh, for various reasons of proximity being the main one. And uh, the first – the the second impeachment trial the, and the very first uh, removal of a federal officer was a federal judge named John Pickering uh, who is impeached and removed from office in 1804 essentially for – showing up to work drunk and ranting like a mani maniac from the bench. Uh, what was at issue here was uh, you know, not just negligence but a level of gross incompetence. In fact, Pickering was, was insane. Uh, you know, he wasn't just a drunk. He kind of lost his, his marbles. Uh, his son was willing to provide testimony to, to that effect. Uh, but uh, – and there was some controversy – in that trial about, uh, well, can you really impeach and remove someone for not being all there, uh, for not having the men's, any kind of mens rea just for being a uh, crazy drunk? And uh, the outcome of that case was you can. Uh, you it know, seemed awfully weird to argue the other way. Like I can see – so I can see arguments that we don't want to remove people for things that look like political reasons or even that we don't want to remove people for – crimes that com happened before they became a federal officer or or even minor crimes but but to take them out because they're just not capable of doing the job seems like the most obvious grounds yeah and i think uh look the the interpreting high crimes and misdemeanors is not like interpreting what uh interstate commerce meant in the uh, 18th century. Uh, it doesn't give you as clear answers. Uh, but yes, the 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 sort of a, a level of incapacity we were talking about with Judge Pickering I think would be a starting point. Uh, there's also uh, 
hypothetical offered by uh, the law professor Charles Black, who wrote one of the great short treatments of impeachment in the 70s, uh, says, uh, you know, if the president decided that he wanted to move to Saudi Arabia uh, because he wanted to have four wives and to conduct his conduct the the job over the telephone, uh, you know, it wouldn't look like what we typically think of as an impeachable offense. But obviously, you'd have to impeach that person for a gross neglect of duty. Uh, so, high crimes and misdemeanors. Madison said this, and uh, it stands to reason that it has to be broad enough to encompass. Uh, negligent, gross negligence to the point of almost abandonment of the office would be one starting point. But it seems also clear that it should not uh, be understood broadly enough to uh, encompass ordinary workaday negligence in uh, mistakes made with a, in a, a position that has now include the executive branches now is over 2 million, uh, you know, federal civilian employees. Uh, it would be, I think, an abuse of the impeachment power to to start talking about impeachment every time, uh, the, you know, someone in that vast and sprawling enterprise screws up. So I've read, and it's great to have someone look into these things closely because you always check your own prejudices and ideas you have in your mind you've been going around with. And one I have is about uh, the impeachment of Samuel Chase and the idea there that's always – he, he came up, uh, I think, one vote short of impeaching him. And the idea – Chase was a – Supreme Court justice. And a, a federalist, and like many federalists around 1800, he was in complete freakout mode, except he would go on the bench and uh, uh, start saying things about Jeffersonian Republicans and the Jacobin elements and all. And even, you know, I, mean, I think he was pretty virulent even by our standards. And so he got impeached or he was, they were trying to impeach him for it. And then the idea that it comes out of this is the people who say like the Constitution has all of this and then you have practice that decides what it actually means and that this was an important thing because the practice, what happened with Chase said we're not going to impeach people for partisan political reasons, right? Or just political reasons. Is that true or is that just a story that – Well, I think uh, – I think – so for the Chase impeachment, uh, Justice Rehnquist before he uh, – Actually, a few years before he got to, uh, to preside over the impeachment trial, President Clinton actually wrote a book on two key impeachments. One of them was the Justice Chase impeachment in 1804, 1805, um, and the other being the Andrew Jackson, Andrew Johnson uh, impeachment in 1868. But uh, Rehnquist's view of the of the Chase impeachment was sort of thank God it failed. Uh, you know, this would have been terrible, would have reduced the judiciary to, uh, you know, just a, you know, in the same way that people were concerned about the presidency becoming a pawn of Congress. Uh, this would have uh, uh, threatened the independence of the judiciary. Uh, Keith Whittington uh, the, from Princeton, uh, I think, has a nice treatment of the, the Chase trial where he talks about how it uh, actually – you know, maybe it's a good thing that it, that they failed to remove Chase in the in the trial, but it actually inf it, it established a new and valuable constitutional norm, which was that uh, judge federal judges were not supposed to be openly nakedly partisan. Uh, they were not supposed to uh, you know, the the key charge and the one that I think that Chase became came closest to removal on was a rant before a Baltimore uh, grand jury uh, riding circuit that sort of denounced the, by implication the Declaration of Independence and the and the Jeffersonians. The other charges involved, uh, uh, you know, bias, partisanship, and unfairness against uh, Republican defendants. And but after Chase, uh, after Chase's impeachment trial, uh, he calm down quite a bit uh the uh and a new norm uh was established that you could not uh 
be an openly partisan uh, player as a member of the federal judiciary. And it seems to me that's a valuable norm. That's really a good point because we've been talking in the last few years a lot about norms, right? And it mostly, you know, it's sort of like, well, I don't know where that comes from and it's not in any book, but it, I noticed when it's violated, it's something like that. But what you're really saying, Keith was saying, this is where one of the impeachment is valuable because it does create norms. And that's why we think that behavior by officials might be odd. It can also be used to enforce, you know, pre-existing norms. And they, in the Chase case, it sort of established a valuable norm, uh, but it can also be used, uh, it, you know, to to vindicate uh, norms that we we already think are are established. So I'll pose a provocative question for you: What the norm coming out of the Clinton impeachment was it that? What uh, he did and the related things was – didn't rise to the level of Im impeachable norm or that it didn't rise to the level of impeachable norm as long as the economy is going at 4 <laughs> percent. Well, that, that's certainly a factor. I mean, look, uh, impeachment is uh, always a mixed question of law and politics and it's certainly uh, – when you're uh, – Facing a Senate trial, it's it's certainly better to be in the middle of a red hot economy as Clinton was, and as you pointed out, one of the weird features of the uh, the Clinton impeachment was uh, I I think his popularity peaked during the <laughs> during the impeachment uh, over something like seventy three percent popularity in the middle of the House impeachment effort. Uh, yeah, you can never divorce politics from uh, from the outcome of a impeachment efforts. Well, the other thing about that one is about the, in terms of norms is it was almost like a distinction was drawn between like perjury that would lead properly to impeachment and perjury that was sort of not really perjury in a sense. It was kind of a – it was perjury but it, it was caused by the circumstances that – and there's a lot of interpretations of what went on in 1998. But uh, it did seem that there wasn't a strict liability for perjury uh, on the president in that as an impeachable offense. No, and I, I think – look, uh, the legal analysis part of impeachment, the constitutional analysis part of impeachment can tell you in principle is something like perjury or obstruction of justice or uh, – uh, illegal war making in principle is that an impeachable offense? What it can't tell you is in any given case, is it a good idea to – it doesn't answer the questions about prudence. Uh, so you, you could have uh, – uh, about prudence, about wisdom, uh, about whether it's worth the candle to pursue this effort. Th those are all uh, political judgments that you hope will be made in better faith than a lot of political judgments uh, usually are. But, uh, you know, the, the the legal analysis can answer that question. So what happened in uh, the Clinton trial is the, the Clinton impeachment effort. Uh, very few people on the Democratic side denied that uh, obstruction of justice was an impeachable offense in principle. Uh, what seems to have happened is that a lot of people decide decided in this particular set of circumstances it it didn't rise to the level of something that that requires the removal of the president what about incapacity that so you've <clears throat> mentioned you can be impeached for incapacity um, which i guess incapacity to extent is just like an absolute form of incompetence because you're just not you're not capable of fulfilling the duties at all. Um, but if you can be impeached for it, then how is that related to the Twenty Fifth Amendment? Well, yeah, incapacity. I mean, we talked about uh, Pickering, the Pickering case, uh, drunken, insane federal judge, uh, in the context of, of sort of gross negligence, but it's probably better understood as a case of incapacity. Um, the 25th Amendment comes along, it's ratified in 1967. Uh, there's, uh, there was no specific mechanism uh, for removal of uh, 
an incapacitated president uh, prior to then, but but I would argue that that's because the mechanism was impeachment. Uh, in most cases, the Pickering case shows that it's available for incapacity. And uh, we've arrived at this weird, uh, because we have uh, adopted a view of the scope of high crimes and misdemeanors that says, and, you know, it needs to be a Nixon style criminal abuse of power. Uh, we've, and because we have the 25th Amendment, we've sort of got this idea that, uh, well, if the president is a vegetable, uh, then you can remove him through the 25th Amendment. If he turns out to be a horrible crook, then you've got impeachment. But for anything in between, um, you you're kind of just have to ride it out until the next election or until he's term limited. Um, but, uh, you know, one of the, the – uh, in the impeachment debate at the convention, that's one of the things Madison mentions is that the president – could lose his capacity after uh, after his election, uh, and he says that, and that could be fatal to the republic. Fatal to the republic at a time when the president presidency was a lot less important and a lot lot less central than than it has become by the twenty first century. So I think in the twenty fifth amendment, they were thinking first of all about Kennedy because there was speculation about him. Weirdly, in retrospect, speculation about him having survived the shot, and but also didn't Wilson play a role in there? And Wilson's interesting because actually you've got a a small R Republican problem because actually the elected uh, person did not run the government, but wasn't it his wife and his chief of staff that yeah. was actually running the government? Yeah, I think they they pretty much shut the vice president at the time out. Um, yeah, Wilson's uh, stroke comes up uh, in the uh, in the debates over the Twenty Fifth Amendment, and uh, what the uh, what the legislators who crafted and ratified that amendment uh, seemed to be envisioning was, yeah, a uh, you know to, to back up the Twenty Fifth Amendment says uh, that uh, provides for for. Uh, two means of removal of a president who is, quote, unable to uh, discharge the powers and responsibilities of his office. Um, one is voluntary. That's uh, usually – that's section three. It's usually invoked uh, during colonoscopies uh, where uh, the president sends a letter to Congress and says, uh, you know, while I'm under anesthesia – Dick Cheney as president or, or as acting president. Uh, the second one that that's that's garnered so much discussion in the the uh, since Donald Trump was elected is Section Four of the Twenty Fifth Amendment, which uh, provides a means for doing it involuntarily. Uh, so the vice president and a majority of cabinet office, officers or such other body as Congress may by law provide. Uh, decide that the president has become incapacitated, unable to discharge the powers and duties of the office. Uh, sends, they send a notification to Congress and uh, the uh, vice president steps in as acting president uh, and holds that position until Congress sorts it out. Um, but isn't – I mean really we've discussed this obviously. Isn't this a short of a Wilsonian-like situation? Isn't this really just not operative? I mean it's – because the president – or an uh, existing president that is physically able to move around can keep coming back at you. I mean it just seems like an uh, invitation to disaster at yes. the highest levels. When people talk about a impeachment as a constitutional crisis, it's nonsense. Uh, but if you want to talk about a, the potential for a constitutional crisis, uh, invocation of the the Twenty Fifth Amendment might actually court that kind of uh, that kind of difficulty. Uh, you uh, you would have a situation, uh, and some of the uh, Gene McCarthy and uh, Bobby Kennedy uh, sort of envisioned this uh, in the debate over uh, the Twenty Fifth Amendment. You might have a situation with two presidents and two cabinets. Uh, the, there's enough uncertainty in the language. While it seems clear that the ratifiers intended that uh, after a declaration of incapacity that the vice president holds the reins until Congress votes, uh, there's some uncertainty about that. So you could have a situation where uh, – 
Uh, Pence sends the notification. Imagine Pence was willing to do this. Pence sends the notification. Donald Trump sends notification, no, actually, I'm just fine, uh, and then fires the whole cabinet. And uh, then you've sort of like the Secret Service has to figure out who to frog march out of the building. Uh, it's a really – impeachment itself is a pretty unwieldy remedy to executive incapacity or uh, misbehavior. Uh, it's definitely a lot more of a kludge and a lot clunkier than uh, – say, a uh, vote of no confidence in a parliamentary system. But uh, compared to the 25th Amendment, Section 4, uh, it, you know, impeachment <laughs> would go a lot – presents a, a lot fewer problems. And uh, on top of which, uh, the – this is – the sorts of things that the uh, people using the 25th Amendment hashtag are talking about are not what uh, – the, the 25th Amendment was designed for. It was designed for Wilson, for Kennedy uh, surviving the assassination. Uh, some of the discussion uh, involved scenarios like a kidnapped president. Uh, mm -hmm. So it, unable to discharge the powers and duties of the office means really unable, not seems like he might do something stupid uh, when he's dis discharging the powers and duties of the office. So I, I think this whole idea is – Fun to talk about, but a, a non-starter. This is a good point, though. That uh, to me, interesting uh, that you've made also in another aspect, which is that originalism isn't just for judges, right? I mean, if we have an originalist reading of the Twenty Fifth Amendment, and there's no reason why we shouldn't have, and why Congress shouldn't try to do that, then we reach the conclusion you've just said. But also, the term high t crimes and misdemeanors, at some level, and I think that's part of your policy analysis is also – I mean the words are in the constitution. They have meaning. All the logic of the originalist uh, uh, court uh, theory, right, applies to Congress too. There's no reason they shouldn't try to figure out what this means and how to apply it. Yeah. Uh, there's a tendency to punt everything to the courts uh, but all branches, all members in, in, in each branch uh, have an independent – constitutional responsibility, a uh, uh, responsibility to try to understand the words of the Constitution and uh, and to act accordingly. And I think that's incumbent on, on Congress as well. So if you had an impeachment effort, uh, I think this is something that's clearly outside the scope of high crimes and misdemeanors. It's not just uh, Donald Trump you know, my Donald Trump stake example, but something that's uh, purely political. For example, there's uh, uh, American University professor Alan Lichtman who was first out of the gate with a book about impeaching Trump. Among the, the charges that he uh, outlines is uh, the, quote, crime against humanity of not taking global warming seriously enough. Well, that's a political uh, – that, that, that's – the, the president should not be impeached on uh, policy grounds, on policy disagreements. There are other tools available to to Congress, uh, you know, to to assert its will, and uh, so that's a, the idea that uh, legislators themselves have a responsibility to. Uh, to try to figure out what high crimes and misdemeanors means and to act accordingly, I think, uh, comes up also in situations like that, not signing on to uh, uh, to impeachment efforts that are not justified by the text of the Constitution. We've seen a flurry of calls for Trump's impeachment, um, quite a lot of them coming even before he took office. We had people calling for his impeachment. We've had books, as you mentioned. We've had law professors writing up op-eds and articles all over the place. We've had members of Congress introducing articles of impeachment that have never – that haven't gone anywhere. And if, if the Democrats pick up seats in November, we're likely to see even more of that. Of of the things that Trump has been accused of as impeachable offenses or have been offered as impeachable offenses, which ones do you think are maybe the most likely or the most kind of squarely within 
what you think are impeachable offenses? Is there anything there or is this all just kind of people upset that their guy didn't win or their gal didn't win um, and so kind of flailing for ways out? Well, I rather scrupulously try to avoid uh, uh, coming down on one side or the other in a lot of these things uh, in the paper. Um, but I'd say, I'd say in terms of what's been introduced so far uh, and what I think is likely to get most traction without saying whether I uh, think it uh, rises to the level necessarily – would be uh, obstruction of justice. It was the first uh, – the, the Comey firing was the first uh, uh, formal article of impeachment uh, introduced against uh, Trump in uh, 2017. And I think that's going to be the one that uh, has the the most legs. The uh, – you know, we it's one of the areas where you have the most presidential – precedent. Uh, Nixon, uh, first article of impeachment. Uh, Clinton, uh, the obstruction of justice. Uh, and uh, particularly if uh, we keep hearing uh, rumors periodically about uh, whether uh, Trump is going to decide to fire Jeff Sessions or Rod, uh, Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein, uh, and or uh, try to uh, to fire uh, Special Counsel Robert Mueller. Uh, I think if he were to to do the latter in particular, uh, you would that would be a case for impeachment that would definitely have legs. The uh, Saturday Night Massacre when. Uh, uh, Richard Nixon had Special Prosecutor Archibald Cox ultimately fired uh, to prove to be the catalyst for impeachment. Uh, in uh, it's really what uh, drove impeachment uh, in uh, seventy three seventy four. Uh, so I would say that uh, that general area is what I'd look to. Uh, the uh, the issue of um, various people have made uh, proposals, although I think only one article has been formally introduced so far, about uh, f undermining freedom of the press. And these have ranged from uh, people that uh, say that, you know, the, there's there's some that, that cite, uh, you know, Trump's use, use of the term enemy of the people and fake news. Uh, the charges that are of undermining freedom of the press that are based on, uh, you know, Trump's Twitter feed uh, in these terms, I don't think are very persuasive. It's sort of a, just a, a less articulate and clever version of uh, Spiro Agnew's attacks on the media, nattering nabobs of negativism. Uh, I don't think calling the media fake news is an impeachable offense. Uh, when you do start talking about, and you've seen this in some of his tweets, uh, about uh, uh, broadcast licenses, about uh, uh, Jeff Bezos, Amazon, Washington Post uh, uh, shipping rates, um, then you you start to get into certainly, you know, the president, uh, it, it is, when you talk about important norms, the president should not be talking about using the power of the state to punish somebody that uh, owns a paper that makes him unhappy. Uh, you might want to see – if it turns out that those comments, troubling enough in their own right, uh, have a little more to them, that they're, they've led to uh, an effort to take action. Uh, you know, there, there's something more than the equivalent of shouting at the TV. Uh, then uh, I think those would be solid grounds for impeachment. Uh, you want to see like Richard Nixon uh, didn't uh, the Article Two abuse of power. Uh, among the charges were uh, abuse of the IRS. Uh, you know, trying to turn the IRS against his political enemies. Uh, he didn't actually have as much success with that as his predecessors did, or the, as he would have liked to. 
But he made serious efforts uh, to obtain the tax returns and to order audits of his political enemies, and that's an impeachable offense. And I think you can certainly make the case that an effort to, say, raise shipping rates for Amazon on grounds that seem driven by the president's uh, you know, irritation with the Washington Post would be an impeachable offense. This struck me that maybe one way to think about this that is wholly extra constitutional, it's not about the language, is that you could think of it this way. We've got a way to remove the president, uh, particularly one in the first term, which is uh, elections, right? So the real question in the first term uh, of, about a president is it, do, is this person done something that we really don't want to wait for the for the actual election to pass judgment on him, uh, and because it's so dangerous, or he's show, it's a sign that what he's done suggests if we wait a couple of years, in any president this would be really risky, or the second version of it would be if we let it, you know, we can't wait for the election because if we let this go, then future presidents it'll become a new norm, it'll become acceptable. And that's really what you're trying to get at here. Those two things is the current risk and the long-term norms. And then you, sometimes, you know, you can push the language back into that, right? Yeah. Uh, there's definitely a prophylactic, forward-looking uh, element to impeachment. Uh, you know, it is not there as much to punish bad actors as it is to uh, – to remove threats and, you know, one one threat can be a current threat. Uh, you know, the idea that – and this this is probably one reason why the – among many that the Clinton effort failed. Uh, it's a one-off. Now he knows not to fool around with the interns. Uh, he, he's been burnt. Um, but uh, – he wasn't thought to represent, a, you know, a continuing danger in the way that, say, an abusive criminal uh, president uh, trying to turn the powers of the state against his political enemies would, would represent. But then there also there is also, as you point out, the idea of, well, if we never take this uh, this constitutional tool, you know, out of its plastic wrapping, uh, if we never use it. Uh, because we, we, we've come to think of it as a doomsday device instead of a safety valve, then uh, you are stuck with the erosion of norms. There is no way to, uh, uh, to stop that slide without, uh, without imposing some price for it. Thanks for listening. Free Thoughts is produced by Tess Terrible. If you enjoyed today's show, please rate and review us on iTunes. And if you'd like to learn more about libertarianism, find us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.